Have y'all have a good weekend? No. Uh oh. Well, glad to see y'all dressed warm, because I think it's probably going to be the warmest it's going to be today. Now. Yeah. Hooray! But we're going to be inside. We're going to be with our friends, so it's going to be awesome. Okay, stuff that's going on <laughs> up at your college, as I told y'all last week, we got the Multicultural Festival up there uh, at uh, the campus in the atrium. Tomorrow from 10 to 1, you can meet some uh, international students and take part in their food, dress, and culture if you're interested in that. Uh, following that, um, we have the Jazz Tet that some of y'all attended. That's pretty awesome. There's going to be a keyboard ensemble, a guitar ensemble, if you want to go to that. Then, on the 16th, we've got um, Shattered Glass, uh, a movie that uh, you can check out and see. Either get the link through here or just go to the Fine Arts and click on it. And how you sign up for it pops up. Uh, then, I just got news about this, um, doo -doo -doo. don't get to see all of it, but basically uh, there's going to be a poverty simulation up at uh, campus on the 17th, I believe. Uh, there are 68,000 people in Collin County alone that live near the poverty level. Uh, there's 4 million Texans that live near the poverty level and basically what they have at this uh, consortium, they have a bunch of experiences, uh, so um, you can kind of sense what it's like uh, to live in a month of uh, near the poverty line. Of course, we got the blood drive. Once again, not sure how many people are going to be able to make it. That's on both Wednesday and uh, Thursday um, from 9 to 4 up on campus in the atrium. And then, on the special events, the first thing y'all can do, uh, if you want to, on your first day of vacation, is go ahead and head on up, and you can see the USA uh, against Wales uh, in the World Cup play. Uh, then on Monday, we got mechanical bull riding. Uh, that if you, looks like most of y'all, that would be during your lunchtime, if you're interested in that. The next day is uh, pancakes and PJs where you get to wear your country PJs. Mm -hmm. Not sure how much of y'all are it's going to be friendly to you time-wise, uh, but I'll continue to let you know of uh, other events as they come up. And basically what we're going to be doing, we are going to have our quiz on um, Wednesday. Uh, I've, I'm pretty sure we're going to be done with the, uh, I know we're going to be done with the lecture. Uh, but I want to go ahead and make sure we have it on Wednesday because that is on Friday. Some of y'all might be gone for Thanksgiving and have it on Wednesday. That's quiz 10. Get it out of the way. Remember, we got nothing but uh, bonus quizzes after that. You're going to have a total of two of them. And the final. Oh! And most important, I forgot to tell you all on Friday, and once again, we have a visitor in our class. She is the director of dual credit, and it is thanks to her that if your parents filled out all the paperwork for this deal, she uh, worked overtime to uh, make sure to get you all enrolled and enlisted up in uh, next semester as well. So check to make sure that you're enlisted for next semester. I, I believe most of y'all are, because I get numbers, I can see where the numbers are. But if by any chance you see, hey, I didn't get signed up, uh, let them know as soon as possible. Uh, so we'll be able to facilitate an easier transition. All right? All right, now if you remember where we started talking about last time, we're talking about most of this stuff is the stuff that's going on in the north, a little bit in the west. Uh, we talked about, we didn't get to this slide, but we did get to this one. We talked about, you know, industrialization, what's going on there. We talked about how the lower class 
was doing, then we talked about how the upper class was doing. We started getting into the cult of domesticity for women. Now, what's the whole deal about the cult of domesticity? Do y'all remember? What were women, women were supposed to, to take care of the kids. Why? Huh? Yeah, because it, it was very important because the kids would become the next generation of Americans. But women were seen as purifiers, remember? They could take the chaotic world and only goodness would come out. That's why when the kids were gone and graduated, what was it okay for women to do? Yeah, volunteer work. Join like uh, anti-alcoholism uh, crusades, join Sunday school crusades to put their purifying talents to uh, the betterment of a chaotic world. Now we've got this new class rising up. Basically the middle class. The new middle class. These are the managers, the clerks, the teachers. And by the way, it was okay for women to be professional teachers at this time, even though the majority were men. Why would it be okay for women to be teachers? Think cult of domesticity. Who are, who are most of the pupils? Children. Yeah, kids. So it was like, well, okay. It, it, it was seen as okay. Indeed, what's a little known fact is in the period after the 1850s, that's when you're starting to see women becoming doctors, becoming lawyers, and then restrictions start to get placed down on that. But you have this new class that basically they're in between the, the haves and the have-nots. And they want to try to be like their bosses. Uh, so they marry later, they have fewer kids, they live in their own communities, just like their bosses do. They too congregate in voluntary associations. These would be like social or trade or professional organizations, like the Masonic Lodges, like the Odd Fellows. They're still in Odd Fellows Hall up in uh, Denton, Texas, that you can go see. Um, and basically, these uh, organizations basically just reinforce traditional values. And it was a way, just like their bosses, might meet at the hoity places like the Dallas Country Club and make their mega deals, well, these guys could meet at the Mason's Hall and make, you know, hey, you're a chicken farmer, I'm the assistant manager at Denny's, you give me a deal on chickens, I can work a deal in, on specials into it, I'm going to make money, you're going to make money, I'm going to look better in the eyes of my boss, you're going to look better in the eyes of your boss. And so, you know, Everything's going to work out. Now that's what's going on in the North. have what's going on in the South. The new cotton empire in the South. Now, of course, this starts out with what appears to be a glint of sunshine. Slavery had been dying out in the South. I mean, in 1782, 
Virginia made it legal for, to free slaves. Many masters had done so. In 1794 or 84, Thomas Jefferson proposed making it illegal for slavery to spread to any of the nation's territories after 1800. I mean, think of that had happened. And, and guys, it, even though it didn't pass, it only missed by a couple of votes. You had some Southern leaders contemplating abolishing slavery and transporting the newly freed men back to Africa. However, something happened. The Industrial Revolution. And the, and the advances that have been made with cotton. Like the cotton gin that allowed short staple cotton that could be grown in less than ideal lands. Everybody got it? So due to this, slavery is revived as a result of this shift to cotton. Yet yeah, planners that could achieve impressive uh, profits of between 8 to 10 percent annually. If you were outside of the cotton belt, where cotton growing wasn't as spectacular, Money was made in breeding and selling slaves. Like a healthy male in his mid twenties might sell for eighteen thousand or one thousand eight hundred bucks. If they were a skilled craftsman like a carpenter, they'd make two. Uh, they'd go for two thousand five hundred bucks. Now, younger or older men or those in less than perfect health would be sold for less, but even a male too young to work in the fields would still uh, get about $250 to $500. Now, if it was a female, that was skilled at like weaving, she might actually go for more than a skilled male craftsman. And these slaves are a major capital investment. Once again, why why did uh, they need why did they feel they needed slaves? Do you remember what's the magic L? Labor. So if you were going to be growing cotton or cash crops, tobacco, the and especially with cotton though, because you had to uh, de-seed the boils, the cotton economy demand uh, depended on large gangs of workers. Now, the slave occupations included service in home and non-field work. In deal from 1797 to 1865, only 81% of male and 69% of female slaves were field hands or labored out in the fields. 2% of slave men and 17% of slave women were house slaves. This would be serving as butlers, maids, laundresses, cooks, seamstresses.
Indeed, 14% of slave women sewed, weaved, and processed food. Whereas 17% of slave men drove wagons, piloted riverboats, or herded cattle. Now guys, because you have slaves that are doing jobs that freedmen could do, why do you think these numbers are important? Why do you think they don't have 100% of their slaves working in the free? Or why do they have slaves doing wagons or herding cattle? Because guys, the South isn't getting a lot of immigrants because it's a slave society. Not a lot of people are wanting to move there. No, I did. Did everybody get that last one? Or do I need to go back? Huh? Good. Now you did have skilled craftsmen, like I said. You had slave artisans. If you're an artisan, you're a skilled craftsman. In the cities, that might form their own guilds, in like Charleston, Norfolk, Richmond, or Savannah. A guild is basically an organization. But this led to legal restrictions imposed on them at the demand of white artisans. In other words, hey, he does too good a job, or these are jobs we like to do that are higher paying. They can be the coopers. They can make the barrels. And as you can guess, as time progressed and we get closer to the 1850s and 60s, these uh, restrictions increase. Ready for the next slide? Okay, what were the living conditions for Southern slaves? Um, they were basic and adequate, pretty much. Uh, they lived in one-room log cabins with dirt floors, usually one fireplace or stove, about 16 feet by 18 feet. But they tried uh, not to crowd more than one family into a home. Now, why might they not have tried to have crowded more than one family into a home? Huh? Yeah, disease. Because as you know, anybody here who's had a family, if a kid gets sick, the whole family gets sick. And once again, slaves were, they believed slaves were needed for the labor. The food they got, uh, they actually got more of a variety of food than the North. Like they lived, they also had molasses, uh, fish, um, potatoes, peas, beans, um, And food complaints were usually limited to uh, we always eat the same thing. And the diseases related to dietary deficiencies. And working and living conditions abounded. But if you were, uh, they affected whites to the same degree when conditions were similar. In other words, if they lived in the same area. Oh. And while violent treatment of the slaves would occur, it was not typical.
Why? Because slaves won money, but if things were tight around the plantation, slaves were the first to suffer. Cut back a little on the food. Cut back a little on the files of giving. So what was life like for the common whites? <coughs> Excuse me. The majority of southern whites were yeoman farmers. I mean, in some of the larger southern cities, families might own stores, craft shops, might be attorneys, doctors, or other professionals. Most, however, were simply farmers. Only a minority of the South owned slaves. Indeed, between two-thirds and three-quarters did not own any slaves whatsoever. And they were usually labeled as shiftless, lazy, idle, backcountry rabble by the planners. Now, of course, whole relations with the planters were very strained because these are the guys that are selling the grains, the meat products, the commodities to both merchants as well as planters. And the relations with the planters were strained. Now, why do you... Well, let's put it this way. Here's... Let's say you, here's a plantation, and three small farmers live over here. Why might these farmers be afraid of the planter and the plantation? What does cotton and a lot of these cash crops do to the soil? <coughs> they kind of wear it out, so you've got to leave a lot of your uh, soil unproductive for a season, then bring it back or certain batches of it. Well, if you want to make more money, you got to plant more cotton, right? So if you need new land, you'll just look over here and you'll have the system to kind of acquire, buy out this farmer from his family farm that's been there for 75 years. All of a sudden he expanded, bought him out. Then he buys this guy out. And this farmer is incredibly frustrated. He's worried because he thinks, hey, if this guy wants my land, he's going to be able to take it. So basically, they would take their frustrations to the ballot box to try to change up the political system. So you have a new sheriff. You have a new land officer. You have new people. That might be able, means you're able to live on your land for a little bit longer. Ready for the next one. Free blacks in the South. Well, the South's small population of uh, these freedmen usually descended from uh, blacks that had been emancipated during the late 1700s. Most of them worked for white employers. Even though a handful worked as skilled artisans or craftsmen, a 
Like you could be a cooper, that's a barrel maker, a painter, brick mason, blacksmith, boatsman, baker, barber. could be a seamstress, a washer, a cook, might run a grocery or a tavern. Restaurants, and actually the, there were some that were held in high respect as folk healers. or midwives. And one economic thing they could have chosen would have been to become a prostitute. Now guys, you'll see things like, you'll, you'll hear that by 1860, uh, 3,000 free blacks in New Orleans uh, owned slaves, were slave owners. Well, that's a little tricky because sometimes if you're a freed man or a freed woman, because there were cases of freed women that did this, and you wanted to uh, free your husband or your wife who was in slavery and your children, you could buy them from the former master, but back then a black wasn't allowed to liberate another black. So they'd be slave owners, but you also had slave owners that owned their own plantations, just as we had Native Americans that did as well. And as it should come knows, as no surprise, as time progresses from the 1820s, 1850s, and 1860s, restrictions on free blacks increase and limitations. Now, why do you think that limitations on free blacks might increase? What is a free black in a slave society? Just by existing, what are they? Kind of a defiance, a defiance against the system, don't you think? All right, the new planner aristocracy. Now, guys, the traditional imagery of great planners is largely mythical. You only had a small elite that owned large plantations with many slaves. Remember, only a third of Southerners owned slaves. Most of these slave holders had small farms with fewer than five. Indeed, to be a planter, uh, you were supposed to own 20 or more slaves. So less than 1% of the slave-owning population owned large plantations with many slaves. But guys, their power was pretty massive. Ready for the next slide.
want to go? Go back. Go back. Okay, most of the planners were uh, self-made men, unrefined. The wives actually played a huge part in running the plantation. number of these planters could live lives in the manner of a grand aristocracy. system. We talked about the building out of the National Road. Also familiarize yourself with uh, canals. Why canals may have been so important. Know what the cult of domesticity was. Who was this the ideal that uh, they tried to impart this ideal to? What group? No, basically, uh, Southern society after 1825. And what was, guys, if I use the word antebellum, A-N-T-E-B-U-L-L-U-M, that always means before the Civil War, before the war. Know what antebellum southern prosperity was based on. What was making it so the planners could accumulate so much wealth? Sure. Know what antebellum or pre-Civil War of prosperity of the South was? know what was making the South, no pun intended, so bloody rich. That allowed it to have a planner society, that allowed it to have a slave society. Can you be the first one, please? Um, yeah, know about the transportation system. Right. You talk about roads and canals and that. Anybody seen Wakanda for forever yet? Really? Y'all not like going to the movie theater and seeing the movies? No, nobody I did. I it's. I heard it's like a box office hit. I haven't seen it, so I can't shake a finger at you guys. OK, 
Okay, so the last lecture, we kind of laid down the backdrop of the big things that are going on. Okay, but this is kind of the fun lecture that follows that, because the next thing tells you about how everything is going. Well, how are people responding to this uh, nationalization and like centralization of industry and uh, expanding outward? How are people responding to that? This is react, uh, responses to the great transformation. So basically here in America, we're going to look at three different ways that people respond. I mean, how are they going to react to this brave new world? Socially, you have different groups responding different ways, like some turning to a new evangelical faith that empowered the ruling of their own souls, about forging close-knit groups. Some responded by violently attacking the new constraints they believed were in their lives. Others joined societies bent of excising the world of all its sins. And others finally responded by just trying to escape altogether. Economically, you have the elite and middle classes sipping tea and reading romantic poems on the burgeoning American literature while the working class was constrained to drink cheap whiskey, rowdy theater performances or athletic competitions. Slaves, of course, were even more constrained. But in spite of all this, each group created a vibrant culture. Politically, not as exciting, I know. But you had old line nationalists like Henry Clay and Daniel Webster who chafed during Jackson's reign. You have the South now during this period becoming more and more paranoid about states' rights. You know, it started with the Essex Junto saying we got to get out of this thing because we can't align ourselves with the West and South. Well, now the South is saying we got to get out of this thing. What are you guys doing? Um, and then uh, you have more and, as more and more Americans are allowed to participate in politics more and more Americans are becoming disillusioned with politics. Um, and the Whigs try to join all these disaffected groups together and change the world. Reactions to changing conditions. All right, now, um, more and more during this period, you have people like Chaucey Jerome. Remember that clockmaker that I told you about that by 1855 he lost everything? Um, he wrote a book, The Scathing Commentary. Basically, he said, one of the most trying things for me now is to see how I'm looked upon by the community since I lost my property. I never was any better when I owned it than I am now and never behaved any better, but how different is the feeling towards you when your neighbors can make nothing more out of you politically or pecuniarily? Pecuniarily has to do with wealth. He says, um, it makes no difference what or how much you have done for them heretofore. You're passed by without notice now. It's all money and business. Business and money which makes a man nowadays. Success is everything. Is that anything like us? I don't know. Now you have uh, geographical expansion, new opportunities in business, produce a highly precarious social world. People were desperate for balance. And guys, usually when people are desperate for balance, a lot of them go to religion. And here in America, we're, uh, we're a Christian nation, So you have the Protestants trying to figure out how to fit, because we're having rising attention paid to the individual. 
Well, it used to be for the Puritans, it was easy. Either you were chosen or you weren't. Either you were one of the beloved or you weren't. Well, now we have more and more of the individual coming up in society. So how is the Protestant church going to try to incorporate that into their Christianity? Well, a guy by the name of Nathaniel Taylor, he comes up with this idea of a more democratic God. In other words, God's already opened the door for you. All you have to do is reach out to him and join him because he's already there. Well, this really hit a resonating chord. And you had a Charles G. Finley, who was a former school teacher, who, when he was 29, goes off to spark an intense revival movement across America. And you had thousands that would attend these meetings. And you'd always take the non-believers and have them sit on what's called the anxious bench. It was called the anxious bench because it was like right up front. Right up front. And you know, and these things were massive, by the way. You know, they'd be at night underneath a huge tent lit by torches and bonfires. You know, where the fire dances. So you have different things in light, different things in shadow, and you have all the believers that are out there, and these these new, you know, non-Christians, and like, do you believe? And everybody in the back, yeah. I was like, do you believe? Yeah. And these guys, I, 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 I guess I want to know. But like I said, this basically you have people at these meetings faint, going to physical spasms, hysteria. It was a very emotional thing. Which, of course, sparked off a lot of uh, other movements, people going out trying to do the same thing. This is called the Second Great Awakening, where you might have as many as ten to 25,000 people in attendance. And these would be like five day long affairs where they might listen to as many as 40 different sermons during those five days, you know, in the mornings. It would be spent talking with other uh, believers and what you thought about last night. And then things started blowing up. You'd go to the afternoon sermon. Then, you know, you'd have your meal or whatever. Then you'd go to the sermon after that, sermon after that, sermon after that. And as you can guess, I mean, this whole thing kind of challenged existing church authority because you had the new bloods coming in. Like you had the Presbyterians, Baptists, and Methodists split. Because of the different realities of where they were. But what's funny is the more and more split offs you give all these churches, the more these this mul multiplicity of churches, it's the churches that are reinforcing a separation of church and state. Now wait a minute, why might the church be against the state helping out any one church? Y'all know? Let's say you're the new Baptist church that comes to town. And you're there, and there's a Methodist church. And that Methodist church, that's where a lot of the wealthy bankers go. So it looks a lot nicer. The pews are a lot more comfortable. If they get even more money from the government, if they get money from the government at all, they're going to make their church look even nicer. Which might attract a lot of the people that are going to your church and take away and weaken your membership. And you don't want any church, because you're the one out there that's, you know, spreading the word, and you don't want to lose a lot of members. 
And in this new deal where you have this explosive growth of all these different groups, actually you start to have a new sense of Christian community. Due to revivalism. Basically a responsibility for your fellow brothers. This led to like missionary outreach efforts, benevolent reform movements, and it also led many within the church to connect and respond to churches outside of their geographic area. Just like if any of y'all go to religious households, to, uh, a religious house today, be it a church, be it a mosque, be it a synagogue, be it whatever, uh, you know, they might say, hey, our sister church over in Alabama uh, really got hurt by this latest uh, hurricane. So I went ahead and I told the uh, pastor over there that we'd raise up a love donation for him. So right now we're going to take a donation for our brothers and sisters in Birmingham. And let's go ahead and the deacons come forward and they pass around the plate. And you know, they come. Oh, we got $220. But they're thinking of somebody else outside of their geographic area connecting America a little closer. All right, next time we're going to start talking about labor unions. Labor unions. We don't like those in Texas. Well. Hey, guys, listen. You need to make sure to stay warm, okay? You have any questions about what we went over today? Nine? Oh. <laughs>